All right, uh, we are live here with Jason Ginter, founder and head honcho at Land Dynamics. Um, there are a few cameras, so just look out in the distance, and one of them will catch you. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. So uh, um, as 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 we kind of get into this, I want to kind of get into you, your background, how you came to be into IT, but also just how you started Land Dynamics. So not not the the hour long story, because I know it's a it's it's meaty, but you know just kind of who you are, how you got into it, and where you're at now. Sure. Well. Thanks for having me, Mike. Uh, so uh, I guess my, my journey through IT started as uh, a dial-up tech support engineer uh, for Stratos Internet Group. And uh, for those in the Cleveland area, I might remember Stratos is like the first $10 a month dial-up back in the day, like late yeah. 90s, early 2000s. Right. The best way to inexpensively get connected to the internet. And uh, um, Definitely made the slog through uh, late '90s, early 2000s telecom, and survived that. Uh, the, the sexiest area of tech. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Dial-up tech support yeah. for uh, people who. I mean, there was actually um, some folks that would uh, intentionally like wreck their settings, and, yeah. and there was repeat offenders of this because yeah. the only way that it was possible for them to be calling about the issue they had was they broke something. Right. And so we kind of became like counselors in a way too. Like people would just literally just call us to have someone to talk to, which was uh, it was an interesting uh, an interesting job. Um, but then that uh, you know with that kind of made my way inside of uh, uh, telecom organizations, started managing DSL networks, and actually built a, a six million dollar DSL network, which I think we put like ten customers on and promptly tore it down. Oh, sounds like a good investment. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Once the uh, once the vendor realized, that, oh wait, we're not going to get paid back on this gear. We want it back, and then uh, then we we took it down. So that was that was interesting. That was it was really um, discovering how to build network at scale because we built it across three cities: Cleveland, Chicago, and uh, Columbus. Okay. And it was it was a massive undertaking to get all of that deployed and up and running. And it was just. Um, it was amazing to see because th those wild times, late '90s, early yeah, 2000s yeah, yeah. telecom, where, yeah. where money was no object, you know, um, to to be able to play with that telecom money, and I learned a lot. You know, I got to to I, I like to say I, I learned what not to do, and during that that phase, uh, during that era of time, and um, then um, you know from there went on to go uh, um, into uh, other ISPs around the area. And moved into a, uh, a local service provider uh, that I worked at for 13 years, yeah. and that really is what that helped me develop. At, you know, from a junior engineer into um, you know to a senior engineer, and then I moved more into product development and uh, learning more about um, how to build the right solutions for for businesses. So actually solving their problems right. uh, and and really solution selling. Um, those sorts of things. So, um, so it was there for a long time. We got acquired, and then uh, we launched this thing. Okay. So, yeah. just took some of those products we were developing at the time, and uh, you know, launched launched on our own to to uh, to sell those to the public. So, um, so that's how how I got to here. So, as far as um, I guess going from from more of a telco aspect to running a data center, more or less. Uh, you, when you were there, what kind of products were you really offering? Obviously, that, that's WAN to some extent has a part of that, but what other services kind of led you to uh, offering some like SD WAN products? I actually discovered SD WAN by selling against it. Uh, okay. When I was at the telecom provider, I was at selling last. like MPLS networks. Correct. I was selling a, a, an MPLS or IP VPN offering where yeah. we would build out a private network mm -hmm. uh, with dedicated circuits for a customer. And then in walks the you know the the guy the guy who's in there selling uh, I think at the time it was like an Ariaka it wasn't even called SD WAN it was okay. called okay. it was called like WAN as a service or something okay. it was uh, it was it was very <laughs> nascent yeah it was brand yeah. new this was like six years ago now and I remember walking out of that meeting and my sales guy goes we got this right you know, they're like they they, don't, they can't touch us I'm like no that is way cooler than what we have. And I was just stunned, you know. I just, I just had never seen anything like it before. Um, an intelligent technology that's always measuring each path 
and can dynamically switch on the fly based on application, uh, dynamically route those applications over whichever link it, it thinks is most appropriate. Like, holy crap, that is amazing. I've never, you know, in I've been in networking for 20 years and never seen that before. Yeah. Um, so that's when I discovered it and started, you know, developing a product for the company I was working for at the time. And then when they were acquired, the, the acquiring company, they really didn't get it. You know, mm -hmm. I kind of talked to them about, okay, um, here's SD-WAN, I think this is going to be meaningful in our space and it's really going to take off uh, because not only is it a, a more intelligent way to manage a WAN by uh, dynamically steering applications across links, but it's also, we're moving into an era now where the cloud is, is just essential. It's, it's, right, right. it's you know, and I, I say hybrid cloud is, is where it's going to be for a long time to come. Um, so you're, you're still going to need data centers locally to put your stuff in, in addition to public cloud like Azure, uh, AWS, Google Compute. Yeah, well, I think that edge computing is changing that quite a bit too, right? Definitely. I think, that, uh, I think that where data centers are now, and especially a couple of years ago where they were hosting uh, private clouds for people, I think that that's going to be back up a layer, and the data centers that are local to a lot of people are going to end up being those edge components. Um, uh, there will always be a place for, you know, I mean, there's still some people that are going to, you know, hold on to MPLS networks forever, right? There's still going to be a place for some of that older technology. And I think there are some use cases where you'd want to keep MPLS networks still. There is. It, yeah. you, we have some SD-WAN customers where um, we put it over top of, the, of their MPLS okay, yeah. as well. Uh, so, for example, call centers. Some mm -hmm. folks that uh, um, QoS and, and SLAs mm -hmm. are, are key, then that becomes the transport. Uh, and, and then SD-WAN really becomes an overlay that you build over top of yeah. you know, the transport that they select. So what is like the most concise definition of SD-WAN? I'd say the most concise definition is an application aware um, overlay network that you build over top of whatever infrastructure you want, you want mm -hmm. to put it on. So it could be you know, standard dedicated internet access over fiber or over copper. Um, can be over MPLS, can be over 4G, can be over fixed wireless. Whatever you want those links to be, they become immaterial. They don't. They aren't the service itself anymore. Mm -hmm. So when we were talking about MPLS, MPLS is really an encapsulated service. The circuits and the way that it's built on the carrier backbone. It's a very specific mm -hmm. offering. Um, whereas um, SD WAN is you're bu uh, building a, a network on top of that infrastructure. Right. So and then you have a lot more control to say. Um, Hey software, I want you to measure all of these links that I'm giving you, and I want you to steer to the best, the appropriate path for the for mm -hmm. the traffic. So, for example, voice, we want to go over the lowest latency path, the, the, the best performing path for that voice traffic, or my BDI. You know, I, I have a virtual desktop infrastructure that that uh, I is very sensitive to. Uh, to latency and jitter, uh, being able to identify which path is the best at that point in time and be able to steer it. Uh, so I guess that's not a short, uh, it's, it's brief, concise, but, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, it's well, it's complicated because it's new, it's still new, right? Yes, uh, maybe five years old is, is older in like uh, it's older in five years, but it's been more prominent in the last five years, is old in technology terms, but it's still new. And when you go into a company, that maybe isn't as progressive. You still are. Um, you still are having to explain what it is, right? And we definitely are. Yeah, because yeah. because uh, it's still, um, it's still kind of the magic pixie dust that you sprinkle on the network to make things mm -hmm. better. Which, funny enough, was what MPLS was at one point. You know, sure. like fifteen years yeah. ago, that was the the magic that you put into the WAN to make things uh, to make your applications work better. And now SD WAN is is going to replace that, take the mantle there. Um, I, I think that um, you know it's definitely become mainstream now. Uh, what do you What do you think are the biggest like uh, misconceptions about SD WAN? That it's going to save you money. That's probably number one. Okay. okay. It's not always going to save you money. So we've ha I've had so many CIOs call and say, "I want you to come in and just quote SD WAN for us and tell my guys how it's going to save you know it's going to slash our yeah. our WAN budget by twenty percent or something mm -hmm. like that." It's rare, actually rarely the case. Uh, your cost, your spend is usually going to be neutral, but you end up with a better performing network, um, more productive workforce because you know you're always up. You're able to use all your paths at once. Um, their applications all work flawlessly. You know it's it's just a better way to do business. 
um, Ian. For the same cost. For the same cost. For the same cost, right. right. Yeah, the that's, same, that's same, a lateral maybe a little, that's worth it. A yeah. little bit more, marginal yeah. increase. Yeah. So when you're, um, I guess when, when, you're, when you're trying to show somebody that, that kind of value and there's a hesitation that, oh, this is, this is more cost effective, the value's in um, just operating better, right? Right. And so what industries are really adopting that heavily and what industries aren't? I'd say, I mean, adoption is across the board as far as verticals go. Um, with uh, SD Win, I think the the larger retail organizations grasped onto it first because uh, um, operationally they they wanted to make uh, make sure that they could always make that transaction happen. Um, now they are also the ones that wanted to see cost savings out of it. So it was for them, they really, you know, fought hard to make sure that, that, that those, those were, were a part of that, uh, that discussion. But um, I'd say we're seeing, um, you know, them retail, we're seeing a lot of professional services companies, actually they're, they're adopting it rather quickly. Uh, so attorneys, um, financial. Financial yeah. services companies, um, design design and architecture firms. We're okay. seeing a, a lot of them because they have um, high bandwidth needs. They're moving big files around, so uh, by nature, SD WAN can bond your your links together, so you can realize the total bandwidth of those links, you know, in aggregate. Okay. Okay. So those guys like that having that functionality. Um, I'd say that that some of the last ones to to adapt would be uh, banks heavy financial companies. They're really concerned about some of the security properties. They, they hold on to that mm -hmm. MPLS network as a security blanket. Sure, you know, sure. um, they, they, uh, they really see that as, um, as the most secure means to transport financial data. What about healthcare? Healthcare is adopting it too. It's less about the, like the main campuses and the data centers. Mm -hmm. They're really using it to interconnect those, those little regional satellite offices that they have. Mm -hmm. So that's always been a challenge uh, for healthcare is how to aggregate those and bring them, tie them back into the network. This is an easy way to do that. Yeah, interesting. So as far as like the players now, I know Velo Cloud's probably uh, like kind of cornered the market, at least from what I've seen in terms of their appliance. What uh, what do you, how do you see that landscape? Because from my my point of view, and again, it's a very um, it's a very linear point of view, and just what I've interfaced with. So I'm I'm kind of comfortable with that, but like. Is there really only two or three options? Are there a bunch of companies really jumping on and trying to have a competing solution, or is it like uh, I mean, even um, I mean, even the, the the virtualization world really has VMware and Citrix, right? Is it, are there just two? Like, how how does that look? So there's probably sixty odd different okay. network vendors okay. out there that yeah. say they have some sort of some flavor of SD WAN because really, unfortunately, it's become a marketing term. Mm -hmm. um, and they're really starting to, there's a few organizations now that are trying to create a standard that okay. say, this is what SD-WAN actually is. Sure. Like these are the, the features and, and functions that are required for you to call it SD-WAN. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, uh, Gartner just added uh, a new magic quadrant called WAN Edge mm -hmm. uh, late last year. Okay. And so that really helped kind of shake all that out too, mm -hmm. because they, they could say, okay, these guys are the leaders mm -hmm. in this new space that we're calling WAN Edge, which is SD-WAN, they, they just called it WAN Edge. So uh, as the, the those names evolve, that they can kind of work. They have their own, they just carved out, so yeah. it's not WAN as a service. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So they've got WAN Edge uh, as their, their moniker for it. And they, they really had three vendors in the, okay. the, the leader quadrant, which is VeloCloud, as yeah. you mentioned, VMware uh, acquired VeloCloud. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're in, you know, if you look at the magic quadrant, the best ones are in the top right. Yeah. So it was the top right most mm -hmm. uh, in the leader quadrant. And then you had Cisco and then Silverbeak. So those okay. are the three right. in, the, in the leader space. Um, some notable mentions, Fortinet's really coming on strong with some, with some interesting options out there. Um, there's Cato Networks, there's uh, Versa Networks. So there's, there's a lot of options out there. I, I would implore folks to do their homework because there are some that we've seen. We've, we've had some bake-offs with a few of these, these different vendors to um, show the customer really how it's going to work in their environment. And some of them are really... I mean, in a bake off, half you know, you see that they're half baked. <laughs> you know, okay, they, okay. <laughs> they are not ready for prime time at all. <laughs> um, and then there's others like the, like Velocloud that you mentioned. You know, the the three that that 
we see the most probably mm-hmm. of the three in that in that leader closet yeah. today. It's interesting that you said Silver Peak because I didn't I didn't know they were in that space. Have they been in that space for a while at this point? They made the pivot. I mean, both Silver Peak and Riverbed, yeah. which are, are traditionally win optimization mm-hmm. um, companies, um, they were relevant when bandwidth was low. Well, they, they had the WAN optimization products. Correct. Right. Yeah. So they had WAN op boxes yeah. that would that would optimize smaller links. You know, yeah. if you went back in the days of T1s and T3s, you had, uh, you know, you were talking about increments of 1.5 megabits per second. Yeah. That's when their products were really relevant. Now that the bandwidth is pretty ubiquitous and it's, mm-hmm. you can get pretty big pipes pretty inexpensively. Um, the, the need for WAN optimization sort of went down, so they, they pivoted into SD-WAN, both of them did, okay. Riverbed and yeah. Silver Peak, okay. both have yeah. SD-WAN products. But Silver Peak made that turn a little sooner, mm-hmm. and I think that they realized that uh, that, that ne- the, the network was changing and that SD-WAN was gonna be you know highly relevant uh, moving forward for the WAN, so they started um, a little bit before Riverbed, and, and it, they really have a compelling product now. Yeah. It's, okay. they've, they've done a good job with with their offering. Yeah, so they've invested in it properly. So that's, that's good. Um, as far as uh, like where you see SD-WAN going then, uh, do you anticipate, I, obviously I assume you, you anticipate a wider, widespread adoption, right? Heavier uh, people just jumping on board. What do you, Are there any, I guess, predictions that you have in terms of what it's going to do moving forward or how that technology might evolve? I think it becomes less of a standalone offering and becomes more of a feature of edge computing, which mm-hmm. you mentioned. Yeah. So, uh, actually, interestingly enough, at Dell World, the uh, Dell, uh, who owns VMware, Velo Cloud, okay. uh, they actually announced a new product. The it's like the Dell EMC um, SD WAN Edge, okay. where they're going to deploy a Dell box at, at the prem mm-hmm. that's going to have SD WAN integrated in it at, 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 to tie all of the, this back into the data center, yeah. back into the cloud, wherever you need it to connect to, and then your individual workloads will be hosted on a VMware hypervisor inside of that host. Is that host like a, like a SAN that's hyper-converged then, or? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that the storage is embedded in it, so I don't think it's, it's probably not much for the SAN, it's more of like a local cache for right. applications. I think that that's what you're gonna find like being, okay. the, being the use case, so those, Low latency applications that that need to be closer to the prem mm-hmm. could then be pushed down and run right on site, and then I uh, I would imagine over time you'll ha- you'll have a, a dynamic ability to move those workloads up and down. So if you need to push an app down to the edge, you can. If you need to pull it back up to the the cloud, whether it's private or public, mm-hmm. you can. I wonder if that's a that's a. I wonder how that's going to affect like data, like who owns that data then? Because obviously that would probably be on Dell's cloud, right? Uh, it, it could. I think it's going to be on VMware. Okay, VMware. so you could host it on your own vSphere then. Okay. Uh, yeah, you could have your own vSphere. Um, you could um, also there's there's a lot of VMware hosted on AWS, and they just announced uh, VMware hosted on Azure recently too. Okay. So the capability to be able to take. Um, applications and shift them to public, Mm -hmm. private, on-prem. I think that that's long-term SD-WAN is going to be a key part of how the connectivity that ties all that together. Okay. Why would somebody not want that? Aside from it doesn't save them money. Yeah. It seems like it's all upside for the most part. I I think so. I think the the, the WAN is going to be, I think just the term SD-WAN is just going to be just WAN. Right. You know, it's just yeah, going to be yeah. the modern way and it's going to sure. be run with yeah. SD-WAN. Interesting. Kind of like how cybersecurity is just going to be security. Right. Right. And that's probably how it, it should be. Um, the only hesitation that I've ever heard for SD-WAN is there's a component to it that lets you see what's consuming traffic and you have a bunch of employees that don't want their uh, employer to see <laughs> 500, you know, gigs worth of data going from YouTube, right? Um, I ha- Yeah, I actually have a funny story about that. We, yeah, had, we, had, a, we had a customer that that brought us in to show show them SD-WAN, so we actually put the boxes in their network. And um, then we saw on the dashboard that it was like 60% of their network traffic was YouTube. Oh. <laughs> and, and what they found out is that their employees would come in and uh, they'd build out a playlist for the day, and they were a manufacturing company, so they had tons of work, they had hundreds of workstations sure. where people were just, that just became the thing to do. 
Um, and they were having constant performance problems on the wider network and they couldn't figure out why. It was because of that. Yeah, you too. And so w we just implemented a policy that said, you know, 10% of the link bandwidth can be used for YouTube mm -hmm. and that's it. And, and you can even shun it off. You can say it, it needs to go on this cheaper cable circuit because sure. we don't want that. We don't need YouTube traffic on our, you know, expensive wide area network circuits. We can just stick it on that, that inexpensive circuit. And then um, they, they pretty much, it was like a, a, after they saw that, they're like, where do we sign? Like they didn't even look at the pricing yet. Yeah, they're yeah, just yeah, like, yeah, how yeah. do we buy this? <laughs> interesting. So what, I guess, are there any other interesting stories that have come out of implementing SD-WAN in terms of what people learn about their networks? Yeah. Um, I think also uh, application, rogue applications that they don't know are, exist, okay. like the, the, the employees are using, they'll, they'll go, Take a close look and go. Wait, why is this like app like UTorrent kind of thing? Or well, uh, let, well, that's happened too. So that that so BitTorrent and we had a, a, a uh, an admin who noticed that that was happening and then he rate limited it down to like 0.01 percent of their link yeah. bandwidth, which made it work just enough to, to come online, but uh, didn't actually work. The the things I'm thinking of are more people are using Dropbox when they shouldn't mm -hmm. be from a policy standpoint. And uh, you know, for, for work things or for personal things? Uh, a little bit of both. Okay. Also, um, uh, so I mean, a lot of those data sharing apps are, uh, you know, frowned upon inside of organizations that have their own data retention policies as far as where things are stored. Um, so, I mean, as those things popped up, those were pretty surprising to folks when they they'd identify. Wait, we told these users not to use this app anymore. They're still using it. So as far as uh, like interfacing with different technologies, it's pretty much, it doesn't matter what you're running in your network, it's good. Um, you can run on top of an MPLS, it can to some extent replace an MPLS. Uh, do you see the Midwest adopting this more than the coasts or less, or do you see it regionally? You know, or how, how cause, cause when I look at, um, like the storage community, for example, there's there's pockets of things that just work in the, the Midwest that just don't, like you, you see violin as a SAN and not saying violin's good or bad or different. You just don't see it, you know, in Boston, you don't see it in San Jose. You're looking at different kind of all-flash startups. Um, so there's different aggregates of, of pockets that happen in the Midwest where, where we're in, but that are just kind of like, how is that? how does that come to be? As I've talked to more people that are from out of you know, either you know the East Coast or uh, like Silicon Valley, or like what are you guys running? Like that—that's what's—that's what you see out there. Like, uh, you know, do you see a big change, or is it pretty much you know uh, the same trends throughout the entire country? I think it's it's actually global. Okay. I think it, okay. it, it, it's yeah. everywhere at this point. I really think it's become mainstream, and I think that that the fact that a lot of the telecommunications carriers have embraced it mm -hmm. and now have their own offerings. Um, they're exposing it. I mean, their sales force is, is everywhere, so mm -hmm. they're they're exposing it to their customers wherever they can. So uh, I really think at this point it, it's matured uh, to be a yeah, stable mainstream means of interconnecting all all of your locations, and it's it's taking off everywhere. I can't I can't think of a vertical or a market that it's not you know uh, top of mind for for sure. most network. Is there um, is there anything that's happened to Telco since you've been in it for a minute? Obviously, as you've admitted, um, is there anything that's been similar to this advent? You mentioned kind of is this is this how MPLS felt when it first came about, or is this is this its own animal? It it, it is, but I think it's bigger than that because the cloud is what's driving it ultimately. Mm -hmm. Cloud connectivity is what's driving SD WAN. Uh, there are so many folks that had their MPLS. And then they had to manage, wait, uh, I, now all my users need to connect to Office 365. I don't want necessarily want to drag them across that MPLS to a data center to get out. I want to put an internet circuit. Now I have to build this complicated routing policy to figure out this application needs to go that way, this one needs to go that way. So, um, you know, I think that they, they uh, that really, the cloud adoption is what's driving it. And I think that what's happened to telecom is they've kind of been obviated by the cloud scanners. Mm -hmm. So it used to be innovation in networking and a lot of technologies happened in te telecommunications service providers. So AT&T, Bell Labs, so much innovation came out of those th those entities and that's where it all came from. Now it's happening inside of Google, inside mm -hmm. of Facebook. 
they're driving innovation now. So you're kind of seeing uh, the, the relevance of telecom. They're be really being relegated to the pipes, the dumb pipes mm -hmm. that carry people's data around. And then SD-WAN kind of furthers that. They're taking the intelligence out of the network and putting it into, you know, basically creating your own overlay network across. Um, it, you only need dumb pipes for it to work. And then you let the SD-WAN, the intelligence of the SD-WAN network, really figure out the best path for you depending on what, what access you have. Do you see uh, like the advent of IoT, or particularly like uh, I industrial IoT or IIoT, uh, really driving that need then? I think so, and that that comes back to the edge edge computing yeah. use cases. So um, you know IoT needs. I heard this as a use case recently. So you know in manufacturing on lines, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made very quickly, mm -hmm. depending on uh, you know the the output of the line, and you know if there's a, an event that happens, what the, does the, the automation uh, do? How how does it get instructions to do you know to react quickly enough? Uh, and uh, I think that that's going to get a lot of that decision making is going to be pushed to the edge, so mm -hmm. that the, the IoT network can then talk to that that edge computing, because um, it takes it takes too long to get back to the data center, or it takes too too long to get back to the cloud to make that choice. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to see a distributed workload, and that's going to be carried over SD WAN because when you when operations depend on the wide area network, mm -hmm. it has to always be on. Sure. So uh, I think SD WAN making sure that the, the connectivity is always there and failing over to maybe a wireless link or you know if, if a, a service provider is having a bad day, figuring out a way around that to get back to where it needs to go. I mean I think all of that that is going to be uh, incredibly important long term. Interesting. Um, this is a little bit of a pivot, but as far as because uh, I, I don't want to forget to mention AI in any podcast or try to jam that <laughs> that round peg into a square hole. Uh, uh, how how do you see is, is are there is there a predictive analytics portion to, to some of these devices that you're seeing? How do you think AI interfaces, if at all, and if it's if the answer is not at all, that's okay. But how do you see AI, machine learning, any of that really interfacing with this? Um, I. I think long, like today, there's not really. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. it's pretty. It's, I mean that that said, I think that there is a certain AI machine learning um, characteristics to te having a business intent mm -hmm. and then t telling the software this is what I want you to do and then it, it pushing mm -hmm. that out to your network. So right. I think that that some of, some of it does exist today. I think where it will. Um, Come along, and, and there's there's uh, room for improvement, and uh, to add more of those capabilities into the network is it coming down from from the business on high. So you know, understanding that um, you know maybe you've got a big sales push, and there you know an ad's gone out, and they're expecting more network traffic, and mm -hmm. being able to to preemptively tell the network, hey, today's going to be a busy day for us, so let's let's make uh, changes to the business policy to prioritize this app today and uh, by the way we're going to need more bandwidth so you know open mm -hmm. up your open up these links and maybe repath re re to uh, uh, to alternate uh, alternate links where available um, so I think that that having the the capability to pass down um, business logic into the network to be able mm -hmm. to adapt to what the business's needs based on changes changes in the business environment I think is where it's going to be yeah, and I guess the tangent that I was kind of that I'm going to go down on that is is also um, so I've known I've known Jason for a while, but uh, there was one project maybe three years ago now that we tried to make work, uh, but I was tr looking at, and that was when I really took a look at uh, Velo Cloud at first. We were trying to look at um, SD WAN as an optimization, trying to put that optimization piece into the SD WAN as opposed to you know using an actual WAN optimization, um, and that that project was. It was an uphill battle anyways, <laughs> uh, and we didn't set out any solutions uh, that we looked at in that round, but um, there's, a, there's an optimization piece to, to uh, I imagine, all of these appliances, and if you had some kind of algorithm that did the optimization for you based on some level of monitoring it's already doing on the network, I think that might be a potential like next evolution for, for some of these offerings, where it says, hey, 
you know, we're going to offer you better connectivity and a better way to do things. But we're also, in doing that, we have agents on your network that are kind of um, accepting information. We can make, um, you know, immediate changes that are not intrusive to just, you know, whether it's a bandwidth thing or even if it's like, hey, you know, um, we noticed this, this behavior is kind of erratic. You guys didn't have all sorts of YouTube traffic yesterday. What's going on this? You know, is, is this an issue? Can we, can we flag this? And that kind of also ties it into using this as also some kind of security component, not necessarily from a, a red team or blue team perspective, but more just from a monitoring perspective. Is that a dumb idea? No, I think I, I think it would be great to have like yesterday. What's going on? This, you know, is, is this an issue? Can we can we flag this? And that kind of yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think that that could be built in, and, and like you said. It, you may not want it to be proactive, you may want, not want it to block that, but at least let you know that that's mm -hmm. happening because it, it could be a normal part of your business that you weren't made aware of, you know, as the network administrator, they could have added a new app and you, you know, you weren't aware that it was getting launched that day. Okay, no big deal, we just add that to the white list and moving forward, we won't be notified about that anymore. But uh, being able to identify anomalies quickly, I think uh, that, that it could have a lot of power. Um, and also um, dynamic optimization of the network uh, definitely, uh, I think there's there's a lot of capabilities and uh, a lot of cool things that are happening there. And in the security space, I've even seen some, um, uh, you know, identification of anomalies and then rerouting the traffic on the fly back to a security appliance. So mm -hmm. saying, this is weird, I don't know what it is, I need to send it over to this, this you sure, know, sure. higher security firewall to inspect it. And then if, if it, uh, you know, if it, block that or if it, it, it deems that it's okay then maybe you know bring it back to the network and let it pass the way it normally does are there any um, are there any like already set compatibilities or partnerships between security vendors and uh, SD WAN vendors definitely okay yeah, yeah. there are some some unique tie-ins uh, for example um, Velo cloud will allow you to host a a security vendor's firewall virtual mm -hmm. appliance right inside their hardware. Oh, really? So okay. you can have the okay. box, you know, the, the Velocloud box on site, drop in a VM that from, from Palo Alto or Checkpoint, I think Fortinet support okay. uh, coming eventually too. Not, not Cisco? I don't <laughs> think Cisco, you they obviously see that one on there. They didn't, they didn't write a certification <laughs> for that yet, sorry. Yeah. But, but continue. So you, so you can run your VMs inside of it and uh, they have those partnerships that already just exist? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So then that, that becomes... You still get to utilize the security tools that your your team's already used to. The nice thing is they don't have to. I I find the most successful approach um, when it comes to integrating security with with an SD WAN is um, use what they already are comfortable with in house. They've probably already already built process and procedures around whatever security solution they have today. So uh, VeloCloud was pretty smart in that they made their, their architecture modular. They didn't try to become a security vendor too. Mm -hmm. they, they have unique things like that where you can drop in a virtual flavor or there's also capabilities to um, dynamically backhaul traffic. So we can say, this is web or mail, uh, SMTP mail traffic. Mm -hmm. I wanna inspect that first. I'm gonna take it back to a cloud security service like a Zscaler or uh, okay. Palo yeah. Alto yeah. Global Protect Cloud Service. And I'm gonna inspect that before it, it, it reaches its destination. Interesting, so do you see um, a lot of, uh, I guess, security consultants implementing these for, for uh, added cybersecurity, or do you think that's not as common a use case yet? Uh, I, I think that it's kind of nascent with the integrations. So I think uh, security professionals are still um, getting their arms around it. I think the network guys are, it, that's one thing that, that we make clear in a lot of the conversations we have. There's these silos that happen mm -hmm. inside of enterprise a lot of times. So you'll have the number guys and you'll have the security guys. Mm -hmm. They're usually two separate groups. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes it's even more silo than that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You could have multiple yeah. security groups inside, right, right. Of, inside of security. So when we have the conversation about SD-WAN with the network guys, we say, well, let's bring the security guys in too. Because mm -hmm. I, I'm sure that there'll be some things we need to talk about here where does the security perimeter need to live because this is all changing. You're going from your MPLS paradigm where you know that that perimeter was hard in the data center or in this in headquarters or wherever it was. It's usually a single point. Well, we can dynamically move it now. We can put it on prem. We can put it in the data center. We can put it in the cloud. Uh, there's there's so many different different perimeters that we can have, and we can do that at a per application level too. Uh, and there's also things like segmentation to figure out. Okay. 
you know, what traffic needs to talk to what, and if it doesn't need to talk to each other, maybe we should partition it. IoT is a good example. Right. You know, from a security standpoint, um, the, the, you know, the attack service on a lot of IoT um, uh, solutions that exist today, pretty large, so you probably don't want that anywhere near your corporate data. Mm -hmm. uh, and putting that on its own secure segment that managed completely differently than your, your, your corporate data or PCI compliant data, um, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's important. And it's UAN is, is in line with all kind of compliance issues, PCI, SOC compliance, uh, the HIPAA, there's really, if anything, it's just an added, added benefit. But those, those, I guess those entities recognize that SD-WAN as something that's okay and good, and they're, they're, they let that ride? They do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so. there's been some, some large financial institutions that, like Fifth Third Bank, for mm -hmm. example, they, they went SD-WAN. Okay. Um, and uh, I know there's some other notable, um, uh, the, the Gap, you know, okay. all of their yeah. Well, re retailers, I mean, I think that it's kind of a no-brainer for them to, yeah. to jump in on that. Yeah. PCI yeah. compliance is there. Yeah. Uh, is permitting, it's, it's again, it's... The, the implementer's responsibility usually, you know, the, the features and functions are there to, to be able to make a PCI compliant or HIPAA compliant solution. It's all in a matter of how you implement it. Yeah, and uh, I guess the, the last thing I kind of on that is uh, security risks. Are, does it pose any? I mean, is it, is, it some, is it a different way for somebody to get into your network? Is it a, you know, something you have to be at least mindful of, what data goes through it? See, that, that is interesting. I mean, I think that bit, one of the biggest security risks is when you create these overlays, uh, building that network on top of the network, mm -hmm. it just uses tunnels. A lot of the tunnels, uh, tunneling protocols that are in use by the SD-WAN vendors are proprietary and they're new. Mm -hmm. Meaning they they're not really you know targeted. They, well, yeah, they're not really tested uh, true. They haven't mm -hmm. been vetted uh, from a security standpoint in some ways yet. So there could be some you know nuance to that. Yeah, uh, everyone get out there and start hacking them. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get, 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 go in, go into a you know a, a business with a bash bunny USB drive, hand it to the receptionist, and go to town. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so true. yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't. I mean, obviously, anything's a security risk if you let it be. But um, yeah, if everything's done through tunnels, I imagine that all the data that passes through is, is safe. It is. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the that's the good thing is that encryption is inherent mm -hmm. and everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, the places where it adds additional security. So that's the one. You know, I would say the one negative, the one thing that has to be carefully carefully vetted and make sure that all those protocols are secure. But on the other side, um, it's doing things like encrypting your data over the MPLS network, which mm -hmm. you don't have natively. When you have an MPLS network, there's a misconception that, oh, my service provider's encrypting that for me. Mm -hmm. it's not, that's not true. Yeah. Uh, it, if you want it encrypted, you've got to do it yourself. And uh, SD-WAN can add that capability over, over a private network. Yeah, great. Well, uh, as we're getting close to that time to wrap up, you know, I appreciate you coming on because I, uh, I, I think SD-WAN is, is obviously a very compelling uh, product that, that keeps on popping up, but routinely people say, what is this? Can you explain this to me? And when they do that, I say, let me call Jason. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. It's not, it's not me, <laughs> right? Um, uh, I definitely like to stay in my lane of networking and security, but uh, obviously it, it's good to play ball with everyone. Um, it, it, I want to also give you time to kind of uh, plug anything you want to, or if you want people to reach out to you, or if you want to continue the dialogue with SD-WAN. Again, I'm not your guy. This is your guy. You have them. So... <laughs> Uh, if you want to, you know, plug anything you want, go for it. Sure. So I'm on LinkedIn. It's probably the best yeah. way to get a hold of me. Uh, Twitter at Jay Ginnert, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, uh, name of my company is Wan Dynamics. So mm -hmm. WanDynamics.com. W A N D Y N A M I C S dot com. Yeah, I'll put all the links in the description for everything. So yeah. So that's those are probably the best places to find me. And uh, I love to talk about SD WAN with folks. I mean, um, if uh, we can help you with anything great, even if you just you want to buy someone else's offering and you want to run it by somebody who, who's been doing it for, we've been deploying SD-WAN solutions for the last three years, I'm happy to do that too. So, Yeah, yeah no, like I said, Jason a, a, is a trusted guy, especially in our community, so uh, really appreciate for you coming on, and I definitely urge anyone that has any interest in it to reach out to him. So, thank you. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah.